Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and we can say boys and girls as well. Uh, we're thrilled to see a packed room once again, and it's, it's great to see some old friends as well across the room. And walking up and down, I've, I've also observed that the best thing has been happening. You've all been chatting to each other and not sitting there, and I think that's probably from the Olympic Games. That's the legacy, probably, that people talk to each other now in more formal situations. But uh, I hope you're all getting something out of it so far. I emphasize that that is what it's all about today. It's your support group, and we want you to get the best out of it. I'm Peter Gwilliam. I'm uh, one of the trustees of the Net Patient Foundation. And uh, I'm here today. I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting to as many of you as I can, and finding out, getting your feedback as to what is uh, happening out there, what you think we're getting to achieve as a foundation, as your support group, whether we're doing what you want, whether you're getting the feedback, it's all that sort of information that today I can learn a lot. The main thing is you're here to learn a lot as well, and that's the aim of the day. We're very lucky, we're very fortunate that we've got uh, three excellent speakers lined up, and there'll be a Q&A opportunity at the end for you to pick up on other bits and pieces as well. I mean, asked to be very nice to the speakers, asked you to be all very nice to the speakers. Um, big thank you today to our sponsors. Pfizer, Ibsen, Novartis have all chipped in today. I'll go on to fundraising at the end, that always comes out then. Um, but it is an opportunity to meet and share experiences. It's a chance for me to thank as well the, the driving force behind the Net Patient Foundation, who's Cathy Bouvier, who's sitting right here at the front. And she is performing miracles as far as I'm concerned. As some of you will know, I've been involved with the group since 2000. And we're well beyond my wildest dreams as to what we're achieving in terms of informing you all, getting information out there. And many of you will know that the drive this year has been the awareness campaign, Suspect the Net, more information at the back. And on that subject, I'm so impressed with all the tables there, there's so much information that you can pick up there. But that's our drive today. We've been getting the toolkits around. And with your help, we'll get even more toolkits to your GPs, to GPs in your area. So if you, could, if you think you can help on that, please do have a word with us. The team also includes Maya, who's standing at the back, waving. Um, Maya's been with us now for four or five years and uh, helping Kathy drive this whole thing forward. And as I say, I'm hugely impressed where we've got to, but you let me know what you think. Um, the speakers give up a lot of time. I'm not, I'll introduce them as we go through each time, but um, as I say, there will be the opportunity to, to talk um, and raise questions afterwards. We'll have a very brief a break for a coffee, tea, and get back to your tables as quickly as you possibly can, so we can just carry on. Um, if some of you prefer to give a, a written question, just a few of us as volunteers will be around the floor, and you'd prefer to give a written question, do that, and we'll go through, and we'll get through as many questions as we can. I've talked about the way that the group's been progressing very quickly. We've got three new trustees on board since last year at Newbury, and we've got some excellent skill sets, and I thank, I know David and Roy are in the room, two of our trustees. And we have a patient panel that's meeting on a ideally quarterly basis. And I know you're all very much involved today in setting up. So without any further delay, I'm going to invite our first speaker up, Tara. Uh, Tara Wyand is dietitian at the Royal Free Hospital. And she is going to cover, I think it is still, Cathy, our most frequently asked question is diet and nutrition. And so, Tara's got a presentation that is going to uh, hopefully answer a lot of your questions. If not, then opportunities at the end, very briefly at the end of her talk, but then the Q&A at the end. So I look forward to uh, meeting as many of you as I can this afternoon. Thank you, Tara. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. OK. Um, I've been asked really to talk today um, because I know diet is something that interests everyone um, and often there's a lot of anxiety around diet. So if we can improve things, um, we can sometimes improve your treatment outcomes and we can also improve your quality of day-to-day -day living as well. Uh, the topics that I'll be covering are types of nutritional intervention, 
carcinoid nets and food triggers, insulinomas, vipomas, treatment-related side effects, weight, special net diets, narrowed bowel, and then I'll go on to talk about carers and peer support. Um, and as, as we've already said, we'll have questions and answers at the end of the day. Okay. Um, some of you might have some questions around, um, you know, having diet versus conventional treatments. Diet's not currently used as a treatment, but it can help with symptom control and stabilising weight. Um, you may have heard something called nutraceuticals, and they're something that may be used in the future as a type of treatment. The research is ongoing, um, but it's not something that we'll use right now. All right. Um, so a dietitian like myself is really the best person to discuss the options of any type of nutritional intervention. There's three main types, okay? The first and easiest type that we often use is called oral nutrition support. And they're the milkshakes and the yogurt drinks and the high energy um, tiny shots and powder supplements that we can prescribe. And they're full of energy and full of protein. Um, the second one is slightly more difficult um, because you, that's inserting a tube of some kind. So either a tube that goes um, through the nose into the stomach, or the jejunum, or through the stomach, um, or into the, um, or two types of um, stomach feeding through a tube, basically. One called a peg, one called a rig. Um, Parenteral nutrition, what we call PN, is something that we use as a last resort, and that's when we can't actually use the bowel. Okay, it goes straight into our bloodstream, um, and it bypasses the normal process of eating and digestion. And we might use that post-surgery. Okay. Um, and now I'll go on to discuss carcinoid cancer and something um, called carcinoid syndrome that some people in the audience might suffer from. Um, it's a collection of symptoms, diarrhoea, flushing and wheezing. Um, and these are people that have a functioning um, carcinoid tumour where there's an overproduction of serotonin which develops into these symptoms. And the best advice that I could give you is to have four to six small meals and snacks throughout the day. Um, eating a high protein diet is very beneficial and sometimes we might need to lower the fat if fat is a trigger of symptoms. I will talk about that in a bit. Um, if it's a high protein diet, things like fish, poultry, lean meat, eggs, beans, low fat dairy products, and a whey protein powder are beneficial to you. Um, either a niacin supplement or a vitamin B complex might be advisable. Um, and this is because overproduction of serotonin hormone can lead to a deficiency of niacin, which we call B3. Um, and the, the doses is, are there on the screen. Um, so food triggers, um, I often ask the patients to record their symptoms around what they've just eaten and around what drugs they've taken and we have like a food and symptom diary that we record these in. Once that's written down, it can be handed to your dietitian or um, your medical team to try and tie in what's causing what symptom. Um, it's a really useful way of doing this. Um, fats, as I said before, can trigger some symptoms and it might be useful, if you think fat is a trigger, to use a low-fat cooking method. Um, but oily fish, one type of fat, omega-3, is very beneficial. Okay? Um, also omega-6 oils, mainly found in plant materials. One type of oil that doesn't go through the gastrointestinal tract is called MCT, which is medium chain triglycerides. Um, and they are absorbed differently 
Um, you can find it within coconut oils, and I believe most supermarkets now sell coconut oil. Um, they're very unlikely to trigger any symptoms. Some people do react to amines, um, and amines are found in aged foods or high caffeinated foods, chocolate, aged cheeses, um, and they can especially cause severe flushing and diarrhea. Not in everyone though, so it's important that you record your symptoms. Some people have a real issue with diarrhea um, and it's important to check for an infection cause first. That would mean contacting your medical team, especially if it's something that's suddenly um, come on. If you get the all clear with infection um, and they think you're fine, um, you can try PERT and that's pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, you would need this if you had greasy, frothy floating stools or perhaps after a Whipple's operation. Um, if you've had your gallbladder removed, um, you could try taking a bile acid binding drug or we can try swapping things around in your diet. So swapping um, insoluble fibre, the roughage in your diet, for soluble fibre, okay, the pectins and, and the, the kind of gummy material within a jam, okay, so increasing that, decreasing insoluble fibre. Eating little and often for diarrhoea is, is good general advice. You can also um, start to cook and peel your fruit and vegetables. If you're having a juice, take a juice without bits in it and avoid smoothies because that's the whole, whole product. Um, you can try probiotics, there's lots of research going into that these days and we would recommend a bifidobacteria or lactobacteria over two billion parts per capsule, okay? They're very potent and um, they tend to work quite well. It's important to state that if you're having chemotherapy, um, a probiotic is not recommended because they are extra bacteria load for your body. Another thing you could try, some people find this works, uh, ground fresh nutmeg, three teaspoons a day, quite good with diarrhea. Um, glutamine powder, five to 10 grams per day, once, um, sorry, ten, five to 10 grams once to three times a day, shouldn't have um, any, shouldn't give you any um, extra symptoms on top of the diarrhea. Um, if you've tried all of the above and things still don't improve, then you can see your dietitian as part of your medical team and they can trial something called a low FODMAP diet. And that's basically a, a diet that's low in fermented, uh, fermented um, carbohydrates, okay? Because these tend to produce gas and sometimes diarrhea and symptoms. We're actually going to be doing some uh, research at the Royal Free Hospital around this in the, in the coming year. So it's something to watch out for. Okay. Um, not everyone suffers from carcinoid syndrome when they have a, a carcinoid cancer. And um, our advice would therefore be just to have a healthy diet, okay? Choosing all the fruit and vegetables from a rainbow of colours. They've all got different properties and different nutrients within them. I'd also say choose two portions of cold water oily fish per week. Um, because the omega-3 oil may limit cancer-related weight loss, um, it can reduce fatigue, and it is great for immunosuppression as well. Um, there's also something you can question within your medical team. Um, have you had your vitamin D levels checked in your blood? Okay, it's important that these are checked um, for your general health. Um, of course, the main source is sunshine, and if you look outside today, <laughs> there's not much going on. We tend to save up our vitamin D from the summer, we store it over winter, and hopefully back in the summer we, we do get some sun, 
but some people might need supplementation, okay? Um, dietary sources aren't great. They can help, though, and the best sources are dairy, fatty fish, and fortified foods. And as I said, you, if you do have a low vitamin D level, um, a supplement might be what you need. Um, just um, be careful, obviously, in the sun. If you've had radiotherapy or chemotherapy, you might be photosensitive. Um, at some point, um, people that have a mid-gut tumour may actually get a narrowed bowel. So the, the actual lumen of the food passing through is shrunk down and you might need to adapt to your diet slightly and reduce the amount of roughage, the insoluble fibre in your diet. If we don't th do this, it can cause blockages. It's important to flush all your body with lots of fluid, keep things moving through. Um, sometimes people really enjoy eating a healthy diet and of course fruit and vegetables, whole grains are all part of that and they actually do struggle to not have a healthy diet as they first did um, and it kind of puts them off meals a little bit. But there are some supplemental drinks that you can try um, to kind of bridge the gap if you're eating a bit less. Okay, on to a, a different type of tumour, insulinomas. Um, they are the most common type of gastroenteropancreatic hormone secreting tumour in the pancreas. Um, the main symptoms are low blood glucose level and neuroglycopenia, okay? When we say low blood glucose level, um, we call that hypoglycemia. Uh, the problems arise because there's an intermittent release of insulin from the pancreas. We don't know when that's going to happen. It might happen in the night. It might happen halfway through the day. Um, but it's not matched like in a normal person where glucose is released from the liver. That doesn't happen, so it can lead to those symptoms of blo low blood glucose level. Um, although diet can, cannot control the release of insulin from the tumour, it can prevent the hypoglycemia. Um, the other thing that might happen um, and I don't know whether we've got any patients in the room, um, you can lose weight or more commonly you can have a problem with weight gain and that's really important that you see a dietitian to kind of tweak things in, in the diet, okay? Um, so one way, of um, a very important way and for patients with an insulinoma is to understand the idea of GI, glycemic index, okay. Um, the GI is a measure of how quickly foods that contain carbohydrate will raise blood sugar levels once they're absorbed into the stomach. A low GI carbohydrate, they're released slowly into the blood and they'll maintain the glucose levels quite nicely. However, if you were to have a high GI carbohydrate, they're released very quickly, but we can use these to treat a hypo episode. Okay, so here's some tips on how to switch to a low GI diet. Five a day, so adding some fiber in there. Fiber reduces the rate that uh, carbohydrates are broken down into your blood. Um, Fats also reduce the rate that carbohydrate is broken down into your blood. But if you're going to choose fats, choose healthy fats. So the olive oils and the fish oils um, and the plant-based oils. Um, you can choose to eat breakfast cereals that are based on oats, bran and whole grain wheat. Um, use breads made of whole grain and sourdough. You can choose pasta, noodles, pearl barley and quinoa. 
choose jacket potatoes and leave the skin on. And then if you're making soups and stews, then add in some beans and lentils. Um, you can also do this with, with salads and kind of bulk them up with protein. Um, if you're choosing a rice, don't choose a short grain, choose a long grain like a basmati rice. And if you like crackers and crisp breads for snacks, go for the whole grain versions. Okay, so I talked about hypos and hypoglycemia. So they can make you feel really unwell and can actually be life-threatening if they get low enough. Diet can help in preventing them. Um, some people need a bedtime snack and they need to set their alarm during the night. Um, and these are the, the types of things that can help treat a hypo episode. Um, four to five dextrose tablets, six wine gums, five licorice all sorts, Lucozade, a third of a bottle, Lucozade Sport, three fifths of a bottle, Ribena, half a carton, and Coca Cola, Fountain, half a can. Um, funnily enough, I left off the 20 jelly beans um, because I don't think anyone's got any hope of counting out 20 jelly beans um, at a time of crisis. Um, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't. Um, okay, on to a different type of tumour. So, vipomas. Uh, they're also a type of gastroenteropancreatic tumour. Um, the main symptom is diarrhoea, but that's actually not triggered by diet in any way. Um, there is some research to show that 50% of patients experience carbohydrate intolerance when they have this condition. Um, what we see in the blood levels are um, low potassium and low bicarbonate levels. And there's a couple of ways we can treat these. In hospital, we can give IV replacement, so intravenous into your vein to quickly boost those levels up. Um, but it's likely that you'll need long-term rehydration sachets um, or supplements like Sando K. Um, although we won't food, uh, use food alone, there are high potassium foods that you can try and they do work quite well in holding the levels of potassium up. Um, for example, a, a small handful of licorice all sorts, um, a medium-sized baked potato and a medium banana. There are a few others, but you can contact your dietitian for those. Um, some people lose weight because of the diarrhoea and because they're not absorbing the nutrients that they once did. Um, and if you are losing weight, then it's important that you speak to your dietitian. Okay, so on to specific treatments that within your net team could be discussed at some stage. Firstly, somatostatin analogues. These are actually drugs that reduce your pancreas making enzymes. And the enzyme that dietitians are most concerned with is lipase. And that's the enzyme that breaks down the fat in your food. So if the drug knocks out this enzyme, we need to therefore give you um, an enzyme to break down your food. So you, you still absorb food and you still get energy. Um, we'll talk about that in detail later. Another type of treatment, chemotherapy, such as the F-cyst type chemotherapy, which includes 5-FU, and that, those side effects include hypos, nausea, vomiting, and poor appetite. It's important to say that you might not get all of those symptoms. Um, if you have radiotherapy, it's really site-specific. Site um, depends where you have the radiotherapy, in which symptoms you get. In both radiotherapy and chemotherapy, I just wanted to note that there's a lot of evidence against taking antioxidant supplements, okay? So enzyme Q10, selenium, vitamins A, C and E might actually counteract the effect of radiotherapy and 
chemotherapy because they're breaking, the, they're helping the body to keep the cells when actually the treatment is trying to break them up. Um, it's kind of 50-50 the evidence at the moment. Um, if you want to just, you know, be quite careful, you know, not having those supplements might be a good idea, but it's entirely up to you. Something that you can discuss with your medical teams. Um, another type of treatment involves surgery, um, and of course, the kind of symptoms that you get around that would depend where the, the, the surgery was. Um, for, for operations like the Whipple's procedure and stoma formations, um, they require greater change in diet, and it's important that you do see your dietitian for that. Other treatments that are available do have less impact on nutrition. Okay, so on to treatment-related side effects. So we'll talk about diarrhea, steatorrhea, constipation, weight loss, nausea and vomiting, taste changes, and sore mouth. Okay, so on to diarrhea. Um, one tip is to ensure that the cause of the diarrhoea, as I said earlier, has been investigated. Um, something useful is a rehydration sachet as a first line, just to replace the body water and the salts that you've lost. It's a good idea to avoid alcohol and high caffeine drinks because they are diuretics and they make our bodies lose more water. Um, it's important to eat small, frequent meals and eat slowly. Blander, less tasteful foods may be better tolerated. Um, and ask your doctor about PERT, that's the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, also bile, site, bile salt binders and antidiarrheal agents because they might be able to help with several causes of, of diarrhoea. Um, in extreme cases, you might need to be in hospital and have intravenous fluids for rehydration. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about fat malabsorption and the effect of you not absorbing fat we call steatorrhea. Um, this can be caused by one or two factors, for example, the treatment that you're having or by a type of surgery that you may have had. Um, and you will recognise this in your stools because they'll be lighter in colour, foul smelling, greasy or frothy looking. Um, it might be necessary to reduce the amount of fats initially until we get control of the problem. Um, the doctors will be able to prescribe pancreatic enzymes to help break down the food so it can be more easily absorbed, but not everyone will need this, so it's just important that you tie in well with your medical team. Okay, so there's several types of pancreatic enzyme. Different companies call them different things. But we would start someone off generally on one 25,000 capsule. And the 25,000 refers to the units of lipase, the fat enzyme inside them. And you'd take 25,000 with a snack or a small meal. Um, or you'd take double that um, if you're having a meal, a main meal. Um, from there, depending on your symptoms, if you're still getting symptoms, then you can titrate it up to a higher level, but no more than 75,000 to 80,000 per meal. Um, if you're on proton pump inhibitors to stop the acid in your stomach, it's important to take those before you take the enzymes. Um, and the reason that all of this is important if, firstly, if we're not absorbing fat, we're not, um, we're not getting the energy, so we might lose weight. But the second reason is that we're not absorbing the fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K. 
Um, and obviously those deficiencies can reduce your health in general. Um, it's also important to get your iron and B12 levels checked. Um, and that's through a blood test, especially if you've had stomach or duodenal, your small bowel surgery. Okay, some people might actually suffer from constipation. So the opposite effect. And obviously, again, we'll need to investigate that through your doctor, your GP either, or you know, your hospital medical team. Um, in this, it's also important to drink plenty of fluids and rehydrate. Um, a high fibre diet and prune juice can improve symptoms and get food going through you. And gentle exercise can also do the same thing. Okay, some people may suffer from nausea and vomiting. And if we can manage the nausea, then we can, we can really get a hold on reducing the amount of vomiting episodes and hopefully prevent them. So eating small frequent meals throughout the day um, might stop you feeling full and might reduce the nausea. Taking little sips of nutritious <coughs> drinks between meals rather than with them may help you stop feeling so full and nauseous. Cold foods and drinks usually have less smell than a hot one. So that's something to bear in mind if you don't like smells. Um, and avoiding cooking smells is something that's quite um, a good tip if you're, you know, you've got a really sensitive nose at that time. Um, so to reduce nausea, the things to have and not to have. Tart flavours, citrus juices, sorbets and lemon curd can be quite good for some people, not for others. Salty and minty flavours can be quite good. Trying plain biscuits, so the blander foods, crackers, dry toast, um, and avoiding greasy or fatty foods. Okay, on to taste changes. So some people may lose their taste. And there's some things that we can do to wake up the taste buds again. Um, you can choose foods which have a strong taste and a strong smell. Hot foods um, tend to trigger the taste buds better. You can use plenty of seasonings, herbs, spices, which react on the tongue. Um, you can add soups or sauce mixes to savoury dishes and sharp flavours, um, you can add those into your salads and vegetables like onions and orange, lemon juice, vinaigrettes um, and a marinade, you know, leaving meat in a marinade for a couple of hours is, is also a good way to enhance flavour. Some people might actually change their taste, this is very common, so something that they used to love they don't love anymore. With both taste changes, it usually is a temporary thing and it does come back to normal, it's important to say. Um, but if you do have a change in taste, um, avoid any foods that taste unpleasant. That's obvious. Um, avoid food to, uh, allow food to cool a little before you eat it. Um, if meat tastes different, just try something else um, or let it cool down. Um, you could try fish or eggs and cheese and dairy products to get the protein rather than having meat. Um, if bitterness is a problem, it's a good idea to avoid the sweet nickeled saccharin um, because that really enhances bitterness flavours in your mouth. Or if a food tastes metallic, um, a good idea would be to gargle on a lemon juice. Um, or even if, if when touching your mouth with cutlery that's made of metal is a problem, you can swap over to plastic cutlery. Some people suffer from a sore mouth and sometimes that's because they have ulcers 
or, th or, or thrush or gum disease or a particular drug or radiotherapy is causing problems in that area. Um, and for this, the best ideas would be to serve something, um, either a hot drink, just let it cool, or let the food cool to room temperature, okay? Um, if you do want something colder, that can be really soothing on your mouth. So things like ice cream are perfect, and lots of people have ice cream as part of their <coughs> diet on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some foods can make the pain worse, so, and these are the salty, spicy things that sting your mouth, like crisps and chilli and curries and mustard. Um, also, rough textured foods um, can really hurt the inside of the mouth, and they're things like toast and crackers and crisps and nuts, okay? It's important to avoid those things. The acidic foods may sting as well, and they're the citrus um, fruits and citric acid in, in drinks, um, fruit juices, vinegar. They can all sting the inside of the mouth. And sticky textured foods, things like peanut butter, stick to the side of the mouth um, and can get you know stuck inside ulcers and that kind of thing, so best to avoid. Okay, on to weight. Um, it's important to say that you must have realistic goals. So for most people, they need to keep an eye on their weight to make sure that they don't lose weight. But that's really based on what type of tumour you have and what stage you are at, especially with treatment, okay? Um, weight loss, especially muscle loss, occurs as a result of disease progression. Um, but keeping a healthy, high energy, high protein, symptom, control, symptom controlling diet is helpful in maintaining weight, okay? What's healthy for one person might not be healthy for you, so it's important that you tailor it to your, your, your type of cancer and, um, and your treatment, everything that's going on at the moment. Okay, special net diets, that's what everyone wants to know. Unfortunately, there isn't one. <laughs> um, as I said, it's, everyone's different, everyone has different treatments, everyone's um, weight is doing something different. So, um, what we would say is don't exclude anything from your diet unless your dietitian has told you to. Um, for example, there's lots of things on the internet following dairy-free, serotonin-free, sugar-free, juice diets or vegan diets, um, and there really isn't any evidence behind any of them. Um, there's also some people that may choose to have vitamin C injections. Um, they are not recommended either. Um, if you want to have a complementary therapy, that's absolutely fine, um, but you do need to discuss it with your medical teams, okay? Okay, I, I thought it was really important that we talk about carers. Carers are very important, um, and uh, they're basically the ones that you know, really get involved in the food and the cooking and the shopping. Um, and, you know, you're very useful to the medical team as well. Um, but I know it, it, food does stress people out and they can be quite frustrated, especially when someone's not eating very well. So I've just noted a few tips um, for the carers. Um, just be there to offer your help, okay? Um, just cooking for someone and chatting about non-cancer related things is best. It just relaxes people. You can set a relaxing environment, you know, scented candles, playing some nice music. Um, just, you know, so people's minds switch off. It doesn't have to be romantic. <laughs> um, 
you know, every day I see people and there's a bit of fallout going on between couples or, you know, daughters, sons, because someone's not eating very well. But everyone does their best, okay? Everyone's, the carer's doing the best, the patient's doing their best. If, you know, if, just, just leave it, walk away and try to help them at the next meal time. It's absolutely fine. Um, and also, if someone doesn't want anything at that meal time, it's fine. You can have a nourishing drink instead. As long as that's occasional, it's, it's absolutely fine. All right. And you can obviously tie in with the medical team and dietitians. Peer support is really useful, as we know. That's why we're here today. Um, a great way for patients and carers to actually share ideas and reduce your anxiety about whatever it is, whether it's treatment or diet or you know, anything, anything that might crop up. It's nice to know that someone's going through something similar. Um, it's just important, especially with um, you know, websites out there, that if you do hear something, um, especially around diet in my area, just check it through with your medical team before you actually start following it, all right? Okay, so really just the lasting thought, and all of this will be available for you to read at a later stage, but any diet other than a high energy, a high protein diet, or sometimes a healthy diet, like if you, you had a carcinoid tumour and weren't suffering from the syndrome, it should all be under the supervising care of a dietitian. Okay, there will be dietitians associated with most departments that you're seen under. Okay, um, and just to you know, emphasise that the British Dietetic Association is the board, um, the professional body for dietitians in, in Britain. I've just put a few resources up there. So obviously the Net Patient Foundation produces a lot of books. They're really useful, um, available through the Net Patient Foundation um, website, also Macmillan Cancer Support, you can call them or go through their website. You can contact the British Dietetic Association um, and find out where your nearest dietitian is. And also something um, which I've used as well, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre is based in New York and they've got some really useful nutrient specific information on their website and that's it